hear me at the back? Yeah. Can you answer what is a plus b the whole square? <laughs> okay. How many of you loved mathematics in school? Put your hands up if you had this question while you were in school. That why do I have to learn all these things in mathematics? Okay. And I'm sure as children maybe you had this question that why do I have to eat all these vegetables? <laughs> or maybe when you grew up you asked this question to your boss that why did I get a salary hike this time? When we are asking this question why, what are we looking for? We are looking for a valid reason, a justification, a logical argument for why this thing is happening. And these form the crux of mathematics education. But unfortunately, many of us have formed a different opinion about mathematics. And we think maths is all about doing mental calculations, learning some concepts, using formulae to solve problems, and that's it. And for this reason, we feel, why do we have to learn all the things that we learnt, especially in high school? Because we don't see any relevance in our real life. And that brings us to the question of goals of mathematics education. And here, I would like to share my thoughts and um, some of my colleagues we have put together as twofold. One is the short term goals of mathematics education and the other is the long term goals of mathematics education. The short term goals are those goals that are typically achieved in school. Where there is a, there is a, a typical curriculum and uh, certain concepts are taught and there is a standardized test to measure how much a student has learned to apply these concepts to solve problems. But as we just discussed, because most of us don't use high school mathematics like trigonometry or polynomials or quadratic equation in our real life, we naturally get this question, what was the purpose of learning all those things? And that brings us to the long term goals of mathematics education. Long term goals are those goals that have to be achieved over a period of time. And these are goals that policy makers keep in mind when they design the curriculum. And these are goals that cannot be measured through a standardized test because it has to be developed over a period of a few years. And these are skills that can be, that can be uh, transferred to other domains which are outside mathematics. And here I would like to share with you six long term goals among the many long term goals of mathematics education which we feel are really important. Starting with pattern observation, abstraction, creativity, reasoning, questioning and problem solving. What is pattern observation? So we have a wonderful crowd here about 100, 150 odd people. Let's say we are 150 of us and we all decide to go shake hands with each other in such a way that each person will shake hand with every other person exactly once. And now we want to count how many handshakes are going to happen. Now doing this practically is going to take a lot of time. So when we ask middle school or high school students to come up with some strategies, they come up with different ways of solving this problem. And one of the ways is by doing simple multiplication. They say each person is going to shake hands with 149 people and there are 150 of us. So 149 times 150 should give us the answer. But there is a catch. Because when A is shaking hands with B, we counted in the number of handshakes made by A and when B is shaking hands with A, it's the same handshake, but we are counting it in B as well. So we'll have to divide the answer by 2. And some students, they see a different way of looking at the same problem. They say that the first person is going to make 149 handshakes. The second person is also going to make 149 handshakes, but the first handshake that he did with the first person has already been counted. So he's contributing only 148 new handshakes. Similarly, the third person is making 149 handshakes, but his first two handshakes are already counted. So he is making 147 new handshakes. And this way, if we see, we are just adding numbers 149, 148, 147, all the way up to 3, 2, 1 and 0. Now, how do we do this addition is a different problem. But we have found a strategy now to attack this particular problem. Now, in a country like India, where we have many religions, I think cricket is one of our, you know, closest religion and when we talk about cricket IPL is like the most celebrated festival so those who watch IPL matches would 
say that there are eight teams in IPL and the rule says that each team has to play with every other team twice, once in their ground and once in the opponent's home ground. In that case, how many matches are going to happen? Now, we can start doing this randomly or maybe we can start following a particular approach. And different people think of this as, you know, they, they come up with different ways of solving this problem. <coughs> going ahead. While you watch this animation, maybe you might be reminded of something which you have already seen or heard before. Does this problem remind you of some other problem? You can answer. <coughs> the handshake problem, right? So, we just discussed the handshake problem and the idea that we are forming right now is about the handshake problem. So, it looks different. It, this looks like a cricket problem and the earlier one was a handshake problem. But now what has happened is that we have abstracted the essence of both the problems and now we have put forth a mathematical problem in terms of dots and lines. And if you have to frame it in a mathematical language, just if I can just show off some, you know, some qualities of a mathematics teacher, we have, just go back, we have eight points <coughs> such that no three of them are collinear and we want to find out how many connections can be made between these points such that every point is connected to every other point and there is no, uh, not more than one connection between any two points. Now, this might not sound very interesting naturally because it is a typical mathematical problem, but if you look at it from the IPL perspective, it is a very interesting problem, right? So, pattern observation and abstraction, I think, follow one after the other or many a times it, go hand, it goes hand in hand. And what has happened in the earlier two examples, we first saw some similar patterns and then we abstracted the structure. And this can be started from a very young age. We can make students observe patterns, patterns in clothes, patterns in tiles, patterns, patterns in bathroom tiles or tiles on the pathway or maybe in vehicle number plates. And once they start seeing these patterns, they come up with some ideas. Like for example, you can see three tiling patterns over here. And even though they might look different, but there is some common structure that is that is there lying hidden in all three of them. And if you look carefully, you can see that for every tile, there are exactly six neighbors. So even though the tiles look different, the structure is the same. The ability to take out the essence is what we call as abstraction. And it's a very powerful skill which can be developed through pattern observation and abstraction. The next is creativity. Now, creativity is something that is often linked with arts. Many say that math is just meant for logic and reasoning, but I beg to differ. Here, I would like to share one experiment which I am calling as the cubing digits experiment, where we are going to follow a particular algorithm. The algorithm is this, that is you take any number and you cube the digits and add them up. So, in this case, I have taken 24, you do 2 cube plus 4 cube and we get 72. We continue the process on 72 and we get 351. You will just have to believe these slides. I mean, the working is correct. And 351, you do it on 351, you will get 153. Do it on 153 and you say, hey, I get 1 cube plus 5 cube plus 3 cube. That is also giving me 153. So what is interesting is we started off with the number 24 and it is getting stuck at a constant which is 153. Now let us look at another problem. If we take 11, we get 2. We do the same thing on 2, we get 8, do it on 8, 5 on 2, 1, 3, 4, 92, 737, stop. We get 371 finally. What do you think is going to happen when we do it at 371? Let us try it out. So, 3 cube plus 7 cube plus 1 cube also gives us 371. So, this is a different constant like 153 and we are getting stuck over here. Now, we give this experiment to schools, I mean to students of middle school and ask them, now pursue whatever questions that you would like to pursue. And what happens is a series of questions which they come up with. And we do not ask them questions, they create their own questions. And here I would like to share some questions which, which have been commonly asked in various sessions. One of them is, could there be other constants like 153 and 371? Will the numbers get stuck at some other numbers also? Or are these two the only numbers? Can there be a specific pattern in numbers which will always result in 153 or 371? 
will the algorithm always terminate for any given number or will it go on forever for some set of numbers and can we prove them or disprove them by any means and what is going to happen if we square the digits instead of cubing or maybe we will do a power 4 what is going to happen now what is interesting is that they start coming up with these questions and they love to solve these questions because these are questions that they have created these are not questions which are imposed on them by a book or a teacher and they start looking for patterns and they see these patterns and they try creating these questions once they create the questions they come up with claims and make predictions that i think this is what is going to happen and once they start making predictions they have to back it up with a logical proof and when they have to prove they have to reason it out and that with that we'll go to the next point that is questioning now questioning is always done in school curriculum but I think when it comes to mathematics, when it comes to things like proofs, we have a one-way thinking process that is developed in the curriculum mathematics, where we have questions like prove that the left-hand side is equal to right-hand side or prove that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle PQR. When this question comes to the student, the student already knows it is true. So there is no critical thinking that they have to do. They just have to somewhere meet the ends and prove that this is true. But instead, if we can give them questions like prove or disprove that these two triangles are congruent. Then they have to first think, oh, is the claim really true? Which is something that they would be doing in the, they would have done in the earlier experiment because they have to first critically evaluate the claim, then come up with reasoning. Then they start coming up with questions and they argue and debate about it and they reason it. In short, they start inquiring. Next. We also don't teach questioning the authority. This is something that we should seriously start doing because the essence of math and science education is to question and not learn the subject as a dogma. But most of us, I think we have learned a lot of things in math and science as a dogma because it is there in the book. I remember clearly when I was in school, I had learned the four tests of congruence. But why don't we have a fifth test of congruence like side, side and angle? Or why do, why do we have to follow a certain way of doing operations like board mass or PEMDAS? Or when it comes to historical footnotes like such and such person or civilization discovered zero, how do we even know that it is true? If we say that it is true because it is written by some authority in the book, we are asking them to blindly follow what is there in the book is true. But instead, if we make them question, I think these children will grow up and becoming and start becoming inquirers because they will not believe whatever is there in the newspaper is always true without questioning. They will not believe whatever is there in the books is always true without questioning. So this I think is a very important thing where they start questioning the authority be it the school teachers, be it the curriculum or anything that they come across. Now questioning obviously is followed by reasoning and here I am taking an example which most of us might be uh, familiar with. The divisibility test of 4, that is, if the last two digits of a number is divisible by 4, we say that the entire number is divisible by 4. But how do we know if it is true? Because it is given as a rule, it is a divisibility rule that we blindly follow. Are we saying it is true because of some definition or it is true because of some axiom or maybe it is true because it is a proof theorem or because my teacher says so. I think most of us belong to the fourth category, at least I did when I was in school because I believed it is true because my teacher said so. But this is not the class of students that we want to develop for the future. We want students who will question, who will try to reason out why something is true in mathematics or science or anything that they come across. Last but not the least, this I think is a very important skill in mathematics and that can be easily transferred to other domains. Here I would like to share an example from my own, my own life. Before I came to teaching, I was in the corporate and in one of the companies that I was working, I was part of a team where we were supposed to bring in money from the clients on time. And I used to see that my boss would give me the worst paymasters. And I had a tough time trying to sort out the you know issues that have happened in the past and clear the outstanding which was already in a mess. And somehow I would do that over a period of two or three weeks or maybe a month or two in some cases 
and then streamline the process. And I would see that my boss would happily take that client and give it to somebody else. And he would give me another client which is already in a mess. And this happened for a few months and initially I didn't say anything because I was new at the job. But then I got a little upset. I started asking him, I asked him one day that, why do you do this to me? And he said something which made me think. He said, Vinay, you are very methodical. While others try to find out uh, mistakes done by certain other people or departments, they are busy pointing fingers at other people and you try to resolve the problem. You try to think why this invoice did not get paid. What should I do so that this can, this will not happen in future and this can get paid very fast. And this was true because that is how I was working and that is what math taught me. You have a problem, how do you achieve this particular goal? What needs to be done just before that so that this goal is achieved? And what needs to be done before that and so on. When we come backward, we are following a very efficient problem solving technique which in economics they call as backward induction. And of course, it is economics and mathematics. So these things, I think these are skills that can go a long way with the students and that can be developed through mathematics if we focus on the long term goals of mathematics education. Keeping the long term goals in mind, a few of us came together and started a not for profit organization called Raising a Mathematician Foundation. And through this program, we started doing, uh, through this foundation, we started doing various programs across the country for students and teachers and some of these programs were aimed at uh, nurturing talents, some programs were aimed at bringing students closer to mathematics, some were in understanding the application of mathematics in other areas like economics, finance and sciences and while we did all these things what we could see that we could not only kindle the interest of mathematics but we could also nurture some really uh, passionate students who were diamonds but initially they looked like glass and we think we were able to do this because the focus was on the long term and the teaching was not meant to pass a certain exam. So coming to this question how do we achieve long term goals of mathematics education? One way is schools can partner with not for profit organizations and why not for profit organizations? Because these are organizations whose first aim is not to make profit they want to achieve their goals. And it is impractical to expect the, the teachers to focus on both short term and long term goals because they are already overburdened with a lot of work in their plate. And if these two, these two entities can join hands, I think that uh, they both will complement each other and the long term goals also can be achieved. Next. So putting everything into context, just to summarize, I will try to follow a backward induction process. We will start from the last, that is focusing on the long term goals will help students transfer these abilities that they learn through mathematics to other domains and nobody will feel that learning mathematics was useless because they start seeing how this can be transferred to other domains. Building a scientific temperament I think is a very important thing in today's times and this is not just meant for uh, students who are pursuing science or a scientist sitting in a laboratory but it is meant for people like you and I who are immersed in social media today, who are immersed in fake news, who are immersed or flooded by WhatsApp messages. How do we know what comes to us is really true or not if we don't build the ability to critically evaluate and question our own belief systems and this I think can be very well done through mathematics and science education. So creating a scientific temperament for a better tomorrow can be achieved by focusing on the long term goals and of course I am sure all of you would agree that even if we don't use these formulae that we have learnt in mathematics in school in our daily life but we definitely need to use logic, reasoning and questioning in our everyday life and these are skills that can be developed only if we look at the long term goals of mathematics education. Last but not the least when somebody asks this question how many of you like mathematics in school, then I think if you focus on the long term goals, many more hands will come up and we think this idea is worth sharing. Thank you.